All right, so in exam three, we're gonna deal a lot with time value of money and its effect on how we account for certain financial instruments. So we're gonna have, we um, don't have to, but we like to uh, offer a small background on time value of money and it's a, usually a subject that about 80, 90% of the class is well learned in. However, there's about 10% of you that probably really need to focus on this stuff and understand exactly what you're doing. So the terminology that we're gonna use in these problems is probably the best place to start. We look at present value, and that's the amount of money at the beginning of a time span of concern. The future value is the money at the end of a time span of concern. So present value and future value, a lot of times in accounting, what we're gonna be talking about are you know 10-year bonds, a three-year note, a two-year note. And so what we're talking about then is the value of the money at the beginning of the deal and at the end of the deal or at the maturity of the note or bond. We're probably also in accounting of payments, which in our context will represent interest, both stated and not state. Uh, the, sorry, for payments, we're just gonna worry about the stated payments and we'll talk a little bit more about what is a non-stated payment or you know, what does that mean? Essentially, the payments are gonna correlate to the cash flow of the bond or the note over time. Interest rate is going to be the rate that, compound, that corresponds to the compounding period that we're referring to in the problem. The interest rate we're gonna use will be what we call the market rate of interest, not the stated rate of interest. And so we'll talk more about that. So the payment's correlated to a stated rate and the interest will correspond to a market rate. And like I said, we'll talk more a little bit about that, but just to start introducing those ideas and those terms. A time period is just the number of compounding periods. So if we have an annually compounding bond uh, for 10 years, uh, then we would have N equals 10. So these are the five components of a time value of money problem. Most of the time, you'll be given four of them. You, you know, Typically, you'll be given the future value, the payment, the interest rate, and the time period, and then you're gonna solve for the present value of that item. And that's gonna be what we would record on the balance sheet. So let's look at some more terminology. This is the basics, and now we're gonna get a little bit more in there. The compounding period refers to the frequency that interest is computed. So we can compute interest annually, semi-annually, monthly. Each time interest is compounded, we take the principal of that item and then add the accrued interest. So if we had a 10% note at $100, if we compound it monthly, the first month we would get $10 of interest, 10% of 100. In the second month, then we would take $110 as our amount because we've now accrued $10 of interest. Multiply it by 10%, that's $11. And then at the end of the second month, we would then have $121, et cetera. A single sum or lump sum problem is gonna be when we just have a single transfer of money, either invested today, um, invested or received today. So if we invested today, it's an outflow. If we receive it today, it's an inflow of a single amount of money, right? And if we invested today, we might receive something in the future. We invest $100 today, how much money will I receive in the future? If I receive $100 today, how much will I have to pay in the future? And uh, annuity problems are going to involve series of equal transfers or periodic payments equally over time. So this is sort of your interest, right? We get interest in a series of equal transfers over a period of time. Um, and then there's several types of annuities. There's an ordinary annuity, and this is where the payments occur at the end of each period. This would correlate more so to the interest. Um, you know, we have a stated uh, interest rate. We are going to be paid, you know, 10% at the end of every year. Annuities do are payments that begin today uh, rather than at the end of the period. And a deferred annuity just represents a, an item where payments will begin in the future. So perhaps five years from now, we'll start receiving payments. That would be, uh, you know, and we'll start receiving those payments every year after five years have elapsed. That would be a deferred annuity. Okay. So what do we do with complex compounding interest? And, and again, it's different than simple interest versus simple interest. In simple interest, the principal never grows. So we just invest $100, we get 10% a year, we get $10 a year, that $10 payment never changes. 
when we compound interest, we get something that's a little more powerful because we take, as I said earlier, any accrued interest and add it to the principal when calculating the next payment. So say um, $1,000 is deposited at 8% compound interest. The balance in three years can be determined by doing a few different ways. Um, first, we could start with 1,000, multiply it by 8%. That 8% would engender $80 of interest, so we'd have $1,080. If we're gonna compound that interest, then see the principal now is 1,080. We take 1,080 times the interest rate, determine how much we would get from that, and it becomes 1,166 and 40 cents. Uh, lob off the 40 cents, use the 1,166 as a principal, multiply the principal by the new interest, and it keeps going and accruing. And so it's more powerful rather than, for example, just getting $80 of interest every year, because if it was simple interest, then we would just have 1,160 and then 1,220 because we would only accrue $80 a year. The first one would stay the same. We could use an exponential formula, 1,000 times 1 1.08, that's just one plus the interest rate, raised to the number of periods. And that gives me the future value. So now we're starting to couch these things or we can start to couch these things in terms of the time value of money we just studied. A present value of $1,000 invested today at an 8% rate of interest uh, over three years gives me a future value of $1,259. We can also use a compound interest table in order to simplify the accounting here. And um, there's going to be four types of tables. Now, this is probably what you're familiar with from your intro course because they love to use these. Um, there's going to be a present value of a lump sum. So that's also called a present value of $1. A future value of a lump sum, which is the future value of a dollar. A present value of an ordinary annuity and a future value of an ordinary annuity. Right? So those are the four tables that are most commonly used. Uh, and we're going to use mostly just the present value tables. So in the case of a future value of a lump sum, the table factor is going to yield the result for the calculation we saw above. Um, what it does is it just takes the interest rate, it takes the number of periods, and it creates a table putting in interest rate I, number of periods N, and giving us what we call a present value or future value coefficient. So you just do that, and then you get a table factor, as I said, equal to one plus i raised to the n for the future value tables of a dollar. And so I did a table right here, and that's all we have to do in order to come up with these numbers. They're not magic, they're not arbitrary. They're just taking, for example, in this case, n goes down the row, i is going across the row. So for the first table factor here, we would take uh, 1 plus 0 0.02, 2%, raised to the third power gives me 1.06, right? And so on for all the, the rows and the columns. Something else that's useful is to learn how to account for the effects of compounding at various frequencies. So annually, semi-annually, or quarterly, what we have to do is make an adjustment here to the interest rate and to N we're going to divide i by the number of times we compound, and we're going to multiply n by the number of times we compound. So on a semi-annual basis, we compound twice, twice a year. Eight divided by two gives me a 4% semi-annual rate, and n would be then six periods because we're going at three years, twice a year, six times. So in that case, then, I would look up the table factor for 4% and six periods, 1.26532. And then if I'm going to actually calculate a present value for present value of $1,000, I'm sorry, the future value for the present value of $1,000, I would then just take the table factor that corresponds to that, 1.26532, to get the amount of money <clears throat> that I would recognize or be have at that date compounded semi-annually. If we do it quarterly, we have to divide by four to get the quarterly rate, multiply n by three to get the number of times we're gonna compound, three, time, three years, four times a year. And then we look up again, the interest rate and the number of periods, one, two, six, eight, two, four is our table factor.
And that gives me, of course, $1,268.24. So as the compounding period diminishes, right, I compound more often, then I get a higher value of money in the future. So in accounting, we're going to be more interested in what the present value of a lump sum is or the present value of an annuity. Um, a lot of times we're going to combine a lump sum and an annuity in accounting. So um, what we're going to look at then is I know a future value. How much, in value, how much money would I have to invest today to get to that future value, right? Um, that's how I want you to think of that. Or you could think of it as I need to pay back a million dollars n years from now, right? Let's say n equals 10. I need to pay back a million dollars 10 years from now. How much money is that obligation today? And it's going to be a lesser amount of money today because the present value of a dollar is always going to be less than the future, or I'm sorry, oops, is always going to be greater than the future value of a dollar which means that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. That's the whole reason why people concentrate so hard on saving cash on their taxes because in the end, no matter how they chose accounting methods, the amount of taxes would net out over time, but they'd rather have savings today than savings in the future. Um, the present value table factors uh, that we use in order to determine a present value are basically the same as a future value. We just invert them such that the future value times one over one plus i raised to the nth power equals the present value, right? We're just solving for present value. Before we had this term on the same side as present value, we're dividing across to get what the present value equals in terms of the future value and these items here. So this is what is in the table factors, right? Again, we just take a percent, say 4%, put it into this formula, at three periods n, put a three in this formula, one plus 0 0.04 raised to that quantity raised to the third power divided into one equals 0.889. And then we take that, multiply by the fair value to get the present value. Okay. Rather straightforward. So I'm gonna ask now, how much money must we invest today to get $100,000 six years from now if there's an 8% interest rate that is compounded semi-annually, or another way to say that is, what is the present value of $100,000 six years from now if there's an 8% annual rate compounded semi-annually? So we're compounding semi-annually. The first thing we have to do is adjust our I and our N. <clears throat> it was 8% our I, our N would have been six years, but because we're compounding semi-annually, that means that we're gonna compound 12 times. We're gonna divide 8% by two to get a semi-annual interest rate rather than an uh, annual interest rate. So that is our, our interest rate and our and period of time. Now, our future value is equal to $100,000. We don't have any payments. So there's no series of payments every year for six years or every half year for six years. So that doesn't work into this uh, formula this time. And we're wondering what the present value of that, all this item, all this stuff is. So first thing I do is go to my table, look at the table factor that corresponds to that percent in that period of time. 4%, 12 periods is 0.6246. Now I have the present value factor multiply that by my future value of 100K, and that'll give me my present value. So when I substitute 100K in for my future value, then I would get, let's see here how many zeros, five zeros, one, two, three, four, five. We would get $62,460 is the present value of $100,000 six years from now, compounded at a semi-annual rate of 4%. Let's look at ordinary annuities now. Ordinary annuities are, again, a series of periodic payments. 
Um, and these are going to occur at the end of each period when we're talking about an ordinary annuity. Now, the example I give you so for, is that um, we have three payments of $1,000 at the end of each year for three years. There's a 6% interest rate. How much money are all three of these payments worth today? So one way you could do this is just do the present value of three distinct lump sums. And that'd take a little while, but um, that's certainly one way to approach it, right? So for the first one, we have a period of uh, N equals one. It would be N equals one, I equals 6%, FV equals 1,000. And because we're treating it like a lump sum, there's no payment. And I just want to know what the present value of that is. And then I would get a second present value corresponding to n equals 2, uh, i equals 6. And again, I'm going to receive $1,000 two years from now. And payments are zero. And then finally, PV equals something. When I have a, a lump sum payment three years from now, i equals 6%. The future value of that is 1,000. That's what I'm going to get three years from now. And payment equals zero just add those strings of present values up and that would give me the present value of the three equally spaced payments. So that's a lot of math, right? We have to look up a lot of table factors. We have to add everything up. There's a lot of chance that we could do something um, improper. And so what we do then is just treat this rather than a series of three equal lump sums added together is by saying, okay, well, this is really an ordinary annuity because I have equal payments across time, as spaced evenly across time, um, and I want to then solve it as such. Now, if I do it that way, then things change. If I'm doing this, solving this by an ordinary annuity, first, of course, I need an ordinary annuity table, present value of an ordinary annuity. So then what I'm asking is, what is the present value when I have a payment coming in at $1,000? That payment of $1,000 is at N equals three, because it's three years total, or actually in this case, we want to say three payments, I is 6%. And in this case, the future value is going to be zero. Now you say, why is the future value zero? I thought maybe the future value would be 1,000 or perhaps it would be 3,000, stop getting 3,000 altogether. But if, let's just pretend, pretending the FV equals 3,000 then what I'd be looking at is a series of payments. If I also have payment equals 1,000, N equals three, what that's telling me is I have a series of payments, $1,000 each year for three years. And because now I've also included a future value, I have also a lump sum of $3,000 awaiting me at the end of that third year. So it would be like saying, what is the present value of receiving $1,000 at the end of each year for three years, and on top of that, receiving also $3,000 at the end of that third year plus the $1,000. So again, that's a different sort of problem. We're typically gonna have an accounting payments and future values together because a lot of debt instruments have a principal, that is the lump sum, and interest payments over time. So that corresponds to a payment and a future value. Finally, we have the present value of an annuity due. The present value of the annuity due is same as the ordinary annuity, except that the payments start today. Um, you don't necessarily need a special table to do the present value of an annuity. All you need to do is adjust your thinking slightly. So if you look at it, I receive $1,000 today, $1,000 one year from now, and $1,000 two years from now, nothing in the third year. How could I work this as an ordinary annuity problem? Well, what is, what you're talking about then, thinking of it not just as an, um, an ordinary annuity, but also um, a lump sum, perhaps like a lump sum problem, you could do, you could ask yourself, what is the present value of $1,000 today? Well, when you phrase it that way, it becomes rather obvious, right? The present value of $1,000 today is equal to $1,000 because we're getting it today. 
Well, that takes care of that payment right there. All we have to do now is account for those two. And so we can add a present value of an ordinary annuity where I equals whatever I equals, right? Um, N, we know would equal two because we have one payment, ordinary annuity, at the end of the first year, a second payment at the end of the second year. Our payments are equal to a thousand. And there's, again, no future value because if we put a future value here, it would mean we get an additional amount in year two already uh, posted to also the payment in year two. So then the present value of $1,000 today is 1,000. We work this problem and solve for PV. We add the present 1,000 to whatever the PV there is, and we get our answer. So um, let me just write down at N so that I can show you how much it would be. Let's say we have, uh, I'm sorry, an I, because we already have our N. Uh, I don't have N for two, never mind. <laughs> Substitute an I and this is what you would get, anything that you want, because it doesn't influence the value of $1,000. So how does this tie into accounting? Again, remember that we typically know the future value. Uh, we want to record the balance sheet value at the present day amount, and that is the present value of that obligation that's in the future, the PV. The FE will typically be the maturity value of the bond or receivable, that is its principal. Um, the annuity or payment is going to be the amount of stated interest we are obligated to pay uh, on a regular basis or the stated interest we receive. I will be what we call the market rate of interest, the effective yield of the bond. And we'll talk a little bit more on that when we, as we get into receivables. N is going to be the number of periods date until the date of maturity. And PV will be the value you want to record again on the balance sheet as the book value of the item we are calculating. So um, you do get to use a calculator, but you have to be conversant in the tables because on the CPA exam, they have a, actually the calculator's on the computer and on the computer software, you don't get to use um, a financial calculator. So while I let you use one for my class, you do need to understand what the tables are doing how to use the tables. It's not an extremely difficult thing to learn and master. Um, the reason why I like you to use a calculator is just that, first of all, you can do things more quickly, and also you can do some more cool things that you can't necessarily do with a calculator. So here's some practice problems. Um, I will just post the answers to these. I will not be going over them in class unless you have an issue with them. So if you do have an issue with them, please email me um, and we can talk about them. It's just something that you need to do for practice and to get some background um, work if you need it. Right? The next part of this module will be chapter seven and we'll talk about notes receivable.